Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of Crypto Mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at CryptoMining.Tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. Links are in the show notes. Untold Stories is powered by Blockworks Group, the only event and podcast production company I trust. For access to the premier digital asset conferences and in-depth podcast content, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. That's blockworksgroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. Really special guest today, Mr. Cheng Peng Chao. You all know him as CZ of Binance. But before 2017, no one really knew who CZ was. And this was pretty recently. And so it's very interesting because when 2017 came and Binance was launched, I was saying to myself, this name sounds so familiar. Who is this guy? And I had looked back in my emails from 2014 and CZ, welcome to the show. We actually, we spoke in 2014 for like a few emails back and forth. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for having me here. Uh, yes. I remember that conversation as well. We, um, I was looking for, for an API key for, for a project that I was working with and you were, you were at blockchain.info. And yeah. at the time, I, I only really remember like very few employees working at blockchain. Um, it was Ben and then my friend Mandrick, who was the um, head of customer su- support at BitInstant, but he ended up being um, the head of customer support at, at blockchain. And I had asked Roger for something for some help and he introduced me to you. I was like, all right, who's this guy? And I remember you had an interesting quote. I, I tweeted it yesterday, but the quote was, because I had asked you, I remember blockchain.info was a wallet that didn't allow people to, um, it was a, it was a, it was a completely uh, user side and um, wallet that was, uh, was what I used since, since the beginning, but it, it allowed me to actually hold my own keys, which back then that was kind of the norm. But nowadays you have this custodial solution. You don't really have, there, there's such a, a, a disconnect now. Most people don't really understand the difference. And I, and I didn't understand the difference because I had asked you, I said, is there a way for the API to like block my wallet or not let my coins go out? And you told me, you told me um, we can't and don't want to have a way to restrict them from using their Bitcoins. We can't limit, freeze, block, approve, or otherwise interfere with the transactions. That's the Bitcoin way. And that really struck me when I had read that recently because that those two lines can really really simply explain cryptocurrency perfectly right <laughs> yes yeah i think back yeah so back then yeah um blockchain.info was uh yeah started by ben reeves and um i was the third person in there and um yeah it was a small team uh non-custodians um a water solution everything happens on the client side inside the browser um so yeah it, uh yeah uh, those were the early days it really was and you went from there to, um, I believe you worked for OKCoin okay for for a little bit, and then you had the idea for Binance, and then I don't know, like six months later, you were the top top exchange. How, where did you get the vision from, and 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 why? Uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll explain a little bit of the history then. Um, so yeah, I learned about crypto, a uh, Bitcoin in 2013, and then joined Blockchain.info uh, end of 2013 um, ish. Um, and, uh, I just, I just really liked the idea. Even back then, uh, there were discussions about running a, uh, pure crypto to crypto exchange, uh, even at blockchain.info. 
but because blockchain info, the teams more heavily to work, more heavier towards the wallet space, uh, so we didn't really do that. Um, my experience always came from the sort of a trading, uh, more more the programmer background. So I was always a developer, mostly on the trading side. So then, can I um, ask you really quickly? I um, there there weren't very many crypto to crypto exchanges. In fact, I remember when you launched, um, and you know, even in those years, th- there weren't very many of them. Everything was fiat crypto, crypto fiat. There wasn't much of a need for crypto to crypto. Why did you think that? That was needed. So um, actually, so even back in 2013, there was this concept of um, the, you have fiat to crypto exchanges in every country because the fiat in every country is different. But once you get into crypto, then you can have crypto to crypto trading. Uh, even back in 2013, there were many what we call altcoins or um, uh, for the lack of a better word, um, just uh, copy coins, right? So there was like a bunch of them. Um, there, there was like thousands of them already because people just clone Bitcoin or clone Litecoin and then make a new coin. Um, but then nobody was doing that uh, back then. The volume is too small. Uh, the altcoin market is too small. Even Bitcoin market was quite small. Um, so uh, in 2015, I left OKCoin. We'll look at that idea again. Um, the market is still pretty small. I think uh, Poloniex actually have just started. Bittrex may or may not have started yet. Um, Poloniex was the original, like when Poloniex. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then um, 2017, um, uh, we thought the market was ready. Uh, Poloniex was, was really big. Big uh, Bitrex were catching up to them. And then, um, but Bitrex was, uh, both of them are in the top 10, and Poloniex usually top one. Um, and by the time we started, uh, Bitrex is number one, and like consistently uh, uh, every day. Uh, very large trading volumes, very active. So we thought we we thought the direction was correct. Um, to be honest, the at, even then the user experience, uh, the customer support levels, uh, the uh, um, device support like mobile apps, all of those things, things are quite weak. I think even today we're still quite weak. Um, so there's still a lot more to improve. Uh, but back then, we, yeah, we saw an opportunity and we took it. But it wasn't just then. It wasn't just that that was quite weak. I think the overall. Um the overall expectation of professionalism from from the sites, Poloniex being the number one, uh, wasn't that high. I mean, p- the people that were trading on Poloniex, and I guess the the the, the users that Poloniex catered to, it was mostly for fun and fun and, and speculation and pump and dump and stuff like that. I mean, you had a troll box on the front page. What does that <laughs> tell you about the professional? I'm, I miss the troll box, by the way. I would I would open it up and just sit there and. And you know the best thing about the troll box was no one knew who you are, so you can just troll people without saying your name. Mm. Yes, the uh, the troll box. We actually, funnily, uh, when Binance.com went live for, on the first day, we also had a troll box, but it was it was a, it was disaster. Basically, people would just say all kind of stuff. <laughs> Why? What happened? Well, people were swearing. There's profanity everywhere, and then um, the people people all trying to influence each other's uh, trading activities by saying that I'm gonna dump or i'm gonna pump this coin so it was it was it was a mess um so we took it off but that so that was the i think by taking that off it was symbolic because eventually you became number one but the reason it's symbolic is from that moment on and and this is very important because not yet were the were the big boys or the the, the rest of the world looking at us so, so crazy yet. Yes, they understood Bitcoin and it was mostly Bitcoin, but they weren't really looking at our industry so hard. And when they did, they see Trollbox, Poloniex, kind of stupidity, kids, you know, children. But when Binance became eventually the exchange, the crypto to crypto exchange that gave the portal into this Alt, and I don't use altcoin in a negative way. I use it alternative to Bitcoin. Yep. Um, when 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 other people not in the crypto space look and they see the professionalism, that to them is saying, okay, now maybe I could take this industry a little bit more seriously. So by not doing that, by not adding a troll box, and by 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 focusing on user support, by focusing on a really good user experience, you started, I think, a fork. In, in the way that we perceive and the way we use uh, altcoins. Would you agree with me? 
Um, yes, I think I, I would agree. Um, I think we did do a lot of things uh, very differently. Well, uh, not so differently from the surface, but we, if you looked underneath the surface, we did do a lot of things slightly differently. And I could go into a lot of a bit more detail into that. Like for um, so, for example, many people doesn't know that even from day one, our, we had our API. Our API is about ten times faster than any other API on the market. So when the professional traders uh, use APIs, they measure this very carefully. And we have I've had multiple reports measured by our clients against multiple exchanges. We are far faster. We actually okay. faster, we actually faster than CME on on the API. That's that's unbelievable and a funny story. I know this is supposed to be un- like your untold stories, but I'm going to yeah. tell you an untold story of mine. Um, it's so interesting that you say that because, so for my listeners, the API is basically what allows two different companies or two different pieces of software to talk to each other. So for example, a very simple example is if you have uh, your own trading software on your computer and you want it to connect to your Binance account, so your software on your computer can say, buy, sell, deposit, withdraw. An API are the endpoints that allow your software or any software to connect to your account on the exchange. And this is very important because it allows for for all these different companies and, and, and the abilities to talk to each other. They are the translators or interpreters and the connectors of the software world. The single most important thing. CZ, back in 2013 and 2014 when I was running BitInstant, the I dude, the APIs of exchanges were shit. Mount Gox API was shit. Every API was so bad. So when I actually sent you that email about the API, I was so flabbergasted and so like excited that you actually took this seriously. And I was asking you such dumb questions. I was like, can the API like can the API just just even like rate limit, you know? And you're like, well, of course it can, you know? And I was because back in Ben Instant, we had to build the, not only do we have to build the APIs for the exchanges, my developers, imagine that. Imagine you having to build the API for a company that you want to work with, but I had to build API wrappers too. It was insane. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, yeah, we, we, we took the sort of, we took APIs very seriously and we understood that the serious traders really need to use the API. So... That's one aspect. For example, a second aspect is um, typically back in those days, any exchange you use, you submit a support ticket, you wait for a month. And this is a financial I'm still trading. waiting for support <laughs> tickets from some companies, by the way. And this is a financial trading platform, right? So I thought that could improve. So we said, we, so, and that's quite easy to improve. Uh, it's easy in a way, but it's difficult in, uh, in another way. All you, all you got to have is your, the right mindset. So I told my team, look, we have to respond within 24 hours uh, for the next uh, three months. And after three months, I want our response to be within the hour. And the team just says, okay, what do you guys need? And so the team says, oh, we need to hire a bunch of people. So go, go ahead, go hire a bunch of people. So that's, that's all you took. So now the customer support in the, in the crypto industry is much better. Uh, so all the other exchanges have caught up. So that's also very good for us. You have to raise the bar. Yeah. For that. Uh, yeah. So it's actually not. It's actually not so much raising the bar. It's that the um, pre, like even Poloniex and Bitrex, they had very small teams, right? So they were they were all this uh, new. Uh, they, uh, everybody is on, in, in crypto is an entrepreneur project right now, but uh, they were just very early days, right? So even today, we're still all early days, and the teams are. Uh, today the exchange is a little bit bigger, but we uh, we started two years ago uh, with basically a very small team, and um, so um, yeah. So I think it's just the early days in the industry. The, the the growth is natural. How big is the staff now at Binance? Uh, we are just at five hundred right now. Uh, if we count all the guys who are taking a salary, kind of uh, per se, yeah. That is unbelievable. Is there one place where a majority of people are located, or you really are very distributed? We are very distributed right now. Uh, worse is that everybody's traveling uh, in some capacity, so they move around quite a lot. I don't like it's hard to keep track of where people are. You know what you need? Uh, Uber has this like God mode where they can see all their cars. You need the ability to like look at a map and see all your staff in real time wherever they are. Um, I think my answer is <laughs> an invasion of privacy right there. So I think my answer to you again is very similar to the previous uh, uh, email that I re- responded. We actually don't want to know. We don't want to. We don't want the ability to know to know where they are. So that goes into your mindset, right? Um, yeah. And I want to ask you kind of where you got that that mindset because 
most people I talk to, I have guests, and they're from East Germany, they're from Ukraine, they're from Russia, they're from um, Cuba, they're from all these places that, you know, f- uh, information was um, very, very tightly controlled. Um, you grew up, from what I read in your family, um, you actually had to leave China because of information, but things that your family was, was saying or, or what it was perceived to be. So from a young age, you really understood the concept of having free information and privacy. Sure. So, yeah, so I think uh, on that part, my um, uh, personal experiences or childhood experiences actually do matter. Uh, they do affect, impact me. Uh, I lived uh, in four different countries, uh, lived like for years in four different countries, like more than like five, six years in each country. Um, and uh, so in China, Canada, U.S., uh, New York, and then uh, Japan, Tokyo, and also in Hong Kong, so now in Singapore. So um, having that kind of – so even when I was young, I calculated it. I never stayed in one city for more than five years. So um, at, when you're moving around the world like that, then you understand that the currency is just localized to one country, and even language is localized to one country. But we live in the same world. So having that worldview uh, and having more exposure to different um, um, uh, diversity, uh, Canada is an immigrant country, right? So you get a lot of diversity there. Uh, being able to interact with uh, many different people, you understand that, number one, um, uh, you don't have a fixed mindset of, okay, this is the only way of doing things. And you kind of get used to the uh, – so when, when I learned about Bitcoin, I got it right away. I was like, this will be very useful for cross-border payments, taking money away, uh, taking money from country to the next country, et cetera. And my, given that sort of a, a migrant um, experience, I was never really uh, into centralized control. So when I saw Bitcoin, it's like, this is great. And even for Binance today – I'm more of the sort of public figure. Um, I take way too much credit credit for the success of Binance, but actually the team is fully decentralized, but the team should take a lot more credit. Um, but interestingly, none of the team want to be too public. So I'm kind of forced to be the public guy. I understand that. And I don't, and I know people that talk about the company and they know that you, you do give a lot of credit to your team. You do tweet about them a lot and you do give your team a lot of credit. Everyone, I think what you've said is a standard that, Anyone who wants to work for Binance, at least, it's like working for Apple or Facebook. Well, I don't like to use Facebook as an example right now anymore. <laughs> Facebook's not the good example anymore. But but seriously, so your, your staff that you've built, um, I feel like they're proud, right? They're proud to work for, for Binance. They're proud to be a part of this revolution because, um, I, at least from the messages that I see, and again, I'm, I'm – and always tell me if I'm wrong, but from what I see, the message that you perceive – is that you that you tell your staff is you're not just working for this company, is that you're in the army of this uh, next level industrial revolution? Yeah. So the message I typically um, tell tell uh, my team is basically uh, it's not about working for the company or maximizing profits for Binance or making Binance stronger or whatever. It's just a mission that we that we want to carry. So the mission is to dis- uh, uh, increase the freedom of money. So I think uh, anybody in Binance, uh, most people who join Binance, or I would say uh, for a large percentage of the team, that's, that, that mission is a very uh, big component of why they're here, why they do the things they do. So And they work super hard just to, for that mission. So yes, they do get paid. They do need to live. They do need to pay rent. They do need to buy food. But I think uh, just uh, having that agreement on that vision and and once they're in the team, they do see that we are, even the decisions I make are not always uh, optimized for uh, shareholders and we actually don't have a lot of them now. So we're actually more optimized for the mission. So I think having, uh, when you're running a decentralized organization, when um, uh, you don't see people every day, they could slack off if, if they want to. Um, but I think it's very apparent that none of the Binance staff slacks off and not only not only even the paid team members, we have a layer. We have a very important group of people who are volunteers, who don't get paid, but they work more than full time for uh, just volunteering, uh, helping the community, helping Binance. Those guys really have strong beliefs as well. So, uh, but so I think it's that belief and that mission that ties people together. But we have to actually really execute it as well. So we can't just say it. But so how? A lot of, um, so a lot of decisions we do are really uh, uh, user-driven. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example, right? 
Tell uh, me an untold story. Sure, sure. So I think <laughs> many, many people don't know this story. Um, uh, in in September 2017, so we 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 launched for about two months. We raised 15 million US dollars two months ago, but we are not operationally uh, we're not as profitable as as we are right now. I think we just kind of break even. We actually spend a bunch of money, and then the Chinese ban uh, met, uh, news came out. And the Chinese government demanded uh, all the ICO projects to return the investment funds to the uh, investors. Um, for Binance ourselves, we don't have that problem because our coin already went like 20x. And no one wants to get the, refu- to get the original Bitcoin they pay. <laughs> so the Chinese government saying, give everyone their money back. And all the users are saying, we don't want our money back. Right. But that, <laughs> but the, Ch- the Chinese government news caused many other pro- uh, projects to go under the yeah. valuation. So we've helped... Uh, four projects to do ICOs on the Binance platform back then. And all of those are underwater. And uh, the, uh, of course, all the investors are demanding to be made whole and the project team doesn't have the money to make them whole. We did the calculations. We came up with uh, uh, the gap was $6 million US million in total. So, um, and we had a very quick uh, team decision uh, meeting. It was about five, 10 minutes. And then we unanimously decided we'll take our own money, $6 million out of that $15 million, that we just raised and make those guys whole. Uh, this is for four projects that's not related to us. Well, uh, we facilitated some of the ICOs, but they're not the independent projects from Binance. Why did you do that? Uh, that's part of protecting the users, right? So that's part of our ethos is to say, look, um, if we do the re- return the funds, uh, we want to make them whole. So uh, we did that. We did that in China, and when that, when that, when when we announced it, there was. We got such strong support. Uh, most most foreign, uh, most non Chinese users don't know this, but the Chinese users all know this. And tied together with the Chinese government trying to shut down the other Chinese exchanges, guess where all the users went? So they all came to us. So, but so that story. <clears throat> so for me, that's the highest percentage of one time payment uh, in terms of funds we ha- in terms of percentage of funds we have. That's the highest amount that we have paid uh, in one shot. Uh, much bigger than the hack we experienced two months ago. Uh, even though the absolute amount is much bigger, but the percentage-wise, um, that's like all, more than a third of our of funds uh, at the time, and we did it. So there's a lot of those really hard decisions we have we actually made. But uh, when we made those decisions, we do follow our ethos. Uh, so we're not purely money dri- money driven, and I think that uh, when you have to make those kind of real actions. Uh, and then people understand. Uh, uh, you actually do mean your mission, and they follow you. If you had, if you had raised fifteen million dollars from investors, they would not have let you have done that. Uh, well, that's the other thing. So if we raised that, hundred percent, absolutely not. If we had a board from uh, institution with institutional investors, uh, number one, we'd have to have a, have a board meeting, uh, which would take like a month to organize, and then that they were all. Absolutely say no, but because we ra- we did an ICO, we uh, don't have a board. Uh, we're kind of a, a pure crypto project, and it was just a couple of team members get well, a few team members getting together. The meeting was less than ten minutes. That was almost half of all the money that you had back then. But you decided to to bail out. For, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. Were you were you fearful for the team itself, or that were, were were the team members of those four projects in China? And you were somewhat feel fearful for them? Uh, no, actually. So <clears throat> none of the team invested in any of those projects themselves. So no, I meant the team of those projects. Were any of them in China that you were worried that they'd get in trouble if if they didn't return the, their money? Um, so uh, no, I think the teams are okay. Uh, because the, most of the teams, even all, all four of those projects, they were actually able to return. It's close to some uh, 75, 80% of the funds to investors. And that's pretty good, but uh, uh, that's that's already pretty good by any standard at that time. Some of the projects just took the money and ran away. Um, so the four projects are still around. They returned eighty percent of it, but then there was a gap. So we just made up for the gap. Uh, it was not so much protecting the project teams. It was really just to we didn't want our users to get hurt by some um, random news that just came out out of nowhere. So that was just to protect our users, really. How big was the company back then at that point? At that point, we were about 40 people. Um, so we were hiring very aggressively, but we were about 40. Tell me, so you talked earlier about like motivation. And so motivation of, of, of people being motivated that they're part of this mission um, is definitely something that is important. <coughs> I've had experience running 
a decentralized company and I've and I've ran companies that were all based in one office. And I personally find that it's it's while it's great to talk about running a decentralized company in practice, it's extremely difficult um, for people that are trying to do it, for the listeners that are doing it. What advice do you have to give? I mean, like, tell me, tell me, how, how is the management style done? Do you have layers? Do you have managers where people do you have a hierarchy? Uh, right. So the decentralized organization is really, really tricky. Um, it sounds really good when you talk about it, but when you actually run it, as you said, it's very, very... Tricky. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's extremely tricky. So in a, in a, in a number of, uh, uh, re- for a number of reasons. When you, so when we had 40 people in Shanghai back then, everyone was sitting in one small room and we had no like blocked off offices. We had one meeting room everybody shared and you can just yell at, at the guy and also just sitting there, you know what's going on. Whereas um, today, um, um, especially when I'm traveling, I don't know what's going on at all. So we have a, and the way to solve that is to have you have many many different chat groups, but then you get overwhelmed with chat groups, right? There's so many groups, so many. You have like, too many. I'm already overwhelmed with my chat groups right now. Right, right. So, um, <laughs> and then even the chat groups don't work as well as in person communication, right? You don't you don't get to see the guy. Um, and if you do this for an ex- extended period of time, the team. Um, the team corporation degrades, and there's more conflicts. There's uh, because there's more miscommunication. There's more room for uh, misunderstandings, lack of communication. And then when you do have to fly, or well, we when you do want to fly everybody together to meet them uh, periodically, it turns out it becomes very expensive. Actually, much more expensive than renting offices. So um, it's actually very tricky to do it right. Um, one of the things I found is uh, the passion of the people helps. Number one. The personality of the of the team uh, of the uh, type uh, the personality types of the team members helps. If you have guys who are very strict, uh, who are very um, self centered or uh, arrogant, um, even if their technical skills are very strong, they usually they break down in a decentralized organization because. Uh, what qualities do you look for when you're interviewing to know if this person would be good fit in your? decentralized organization sure so um yeah internally we actually have three words um we look for people who are hardcore so uh, who have a very strong inner compass and who overcome difficulties to get shit done the second word is that we look for people who are humble so uh, if you think you're really hot shot and you have if you think you're always right um if you think you're above everybody else then that doesn't work in our in our organization. We want somebody who's more down to the down to earth. Even though you, we want you to be technically strong, but you want we want the attitude to be very humble. Um, and so uh, most of the team doesn't brag brag outside of uh, into the outside that part of Binance, etc. Um, the third quality, the third third word we use, uh, we we want, we look for freedom seekers. So the guy have to want a lot of uh, want to seek freedom. Freedom seekers. Yes, I love that. So the, uh, that that's, we uh, we found that the combination of those three qualities fits Binance best. Uh, we tried. Uh, we 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 actually did a brainstorming session to come up with those with those three words because we tried to figure out why some people work for Binance, some people don't. Um, and uh, that uh, it ca- it came down to those uh, uh, three simple words, and that worked out. That works quite well. Over the course of the 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 company, um, when you launched, you were a crypto only company. You still very very to 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 most of an extent you are, and you had an opportunity to really not only have your team, as we've talked about, be decentralized, but your whole company to be completely decentralized. And but oh, what I've what what we've noticed and what what has happened also, which is a very good thing, is that you started connecting with governments. I mean, uh, it looks like that you're best friends with the prime minister of Malta and you, you pave the way for, for that, the, the licensing scheme over there and for um, the summits and the connections to the governments. And I assume that you talk to other governments when other crypto only companies have decided to say, we are crypto only. We don't want to work with the government. We don't want to do any of that. Um, even though you're freedom seeking and even though you have a sour taste in your mouth, I feel like, from growing up from uh, family history. Why did you decide to be proactive and to to, to, to work with, with various uh, governments in kind of moving this crypto space forward? Sure, sure. So I think there's a couple <clears throat> aspects to it. Um, the first aspect is uh, basically, um, I personally, I'm not an extremist. So I'm not like 
pure libertarian. I'm not pure decentralization. Uh, you don't like labels, a hundred percent. No, I think uh, I think there's a balance in life, and uh, uh, being an extremist, um, <clears throat> it doesn't really. It's not. It, it's just. It's not my personality. It's not effective either. So uh, the second uh, point is really <clears throat> uh, the effectiveness. What, what's the most effective way to get things done? To pr- to push things forward. To move things forward. So even though I I am very I do very much like decentralization, but I don't think that we can go from uh, the society we have today and the technologies we have today to purely decentralize everything running in one laptop or in thousands of laptops uh, over a thousand times uh, in one step. So I think there's small steps we have to take um, to get there. So we want to increase the level of decentralization today, and uh, we want to. Uh, increase the freedom that uh, a freedom of money. I don't. I I, I do believe that with the 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 currency we have today are way too uh, strict, uh, too restricted, too limiting. So I want to achieve that goal in the most effective way. And the most effective way is not so much I will make the most decentralized app that nobody uses, no, or nobody knows how to use. So we got to be very program- programmatic about it. Uh, the key is actually to making things that people will use, and that's one step more decentralized well there's a trade-off yeah you know between privacy and security and user experience it's like a lever as the user experience goes up privacy and security goes down and like you said as decentralized decentralization privacy go up user experience go down and no one's going to use it so where's the balance where's the medium so the balance is ba- <laughs> the balance is uh you know very simple ways to uh, increase the uh, decentralization and freedom and privacy one step so that we still make a lot, large number of people use it. Uh, if it if not a large number of people use it, then the effectiveness of uh, of your uh, work is not that high. So um, so that's kind of always my mentality. So we got very lucky with Binance.com when we said, well, even though Binance.com itself is a centralized exchange, we promoted the uh, uh, availability, of the li- we provide the liquidity for decentralized tokens or coins, and we have a large number of users, so we provide a very valuable service, so that's good. And then I look at the next step is, well, in 2018, there was all these concerns about regulatory issues, etc. cetera. Um, in, in the position we're in, we said, well, we have to help with that as well. So then I look around, I said, what's the best way to help? Um, if I try to talk to some of the bigger governments, um, I don't even know who to talk to because the government is so big in big countries. There's so many different departments, so many different uh, offices, so many different people, right? Um, whereas if I talk to, let's say, uh, the government of Malta, very quickly you can identify the, pre- the prime minister, um, the guy in charge of the uh, blockchain technology initiative in the government. Um, and if I talk with the, uh, if I went to Bermuda, um, I talk with the premier uh, uh, there directly. So uh, it's not so much I choose them, it's that you kind of choose each other, right? So I, I felt that by going to those smaller countries, I'll be most effective. And um, having a, a number of co- uh, small countries accepting crypto and blockchain technology and accepting uh, and welcoming businesses like ours helps our industry. And I just felt that's the most effective thing to do. So I, I went out there and we had the means. Uh, those guys were, uh, there were people introducing us to them, introducing them to us. Uh, so we had the opportunity there. So we, I just took it. So I flew around a lot in 2018, uh, meeting head of states uh, everywhere. So there's a lot of guys I haven't, I've not publicized because either they're slightly negative or they, uh, sure. or, or we haven't progressed far enough. So yeah, I mean, yeah. So we just do whatever we think are the most effective things to push this industry forward. As a mining equipment broker, Scott Offord wants to make sure his clients are well-informed and making data-backed business decisions. Scott created the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI for miners. It's a better way to compare the efficiency of various models of ASIC miners and to see how the price of the miner and the efficiency impacts your mining profitability. So check it out at CryptoMining.Tools and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O F F O R D. S C O T T. What's your favorite experience meeting with like a head of state where you ever just like saying to yourself, here I am in my shorts and flip flops talking to like a prime minister or something like that. Yeah. I think that the Bermuda shorts definitely has got to be the best experience. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I got off the airport. I got picked up by the uh, president's protocol, um, or the uh, premier's protocol, which is basically one BMW 7 Series. Um, what's in, really interesting is the guy, the driver who got out, it's just one driver. Uh, that's the protocol. Um, the driver got out. He was in shorts and he was in high socks. I was like, that's kind of an interesting outfit. And then, uh, <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh and then I I went to meet a couple of other guys first, and the guy who were, the guy who was supposed to like basically my uh, I guess my handler or my the guy who was taking care of me, he's in su- uh, a shirt suit and the shorts and high socks. I was like, wow, that's interesting. And he's like, no, this is formal wear. This is Bermuda, Bermuda formal wear. I was like, I gotta I gotta get into those. So he got he, so we went to a store buy that. Uh, I got on, and that got so viral. So because a lot of people still don't, don't understand that that's the formal custom in uh, Bermuda, but it's great. Um, it, it, it's a really it's a really fun experience. Do you still wear it? I still have it. Um, uh, I don't wear. It. <laughs> so the Bermuda shorts are very strict. Um, you can't have too many pockets in the shorts, and the ho- socks have to be like no further than two inches away from your knee. So it's got to be high socks. So norm, I, I don't wear those high socks, but I do wear the shorts all the time. So. You can't really walk around in high socks in Singapore or wherever you are in the world. It won't really make any sense. Yeah, that, uh, that would not make sense. But you, no, but the, the the custom is very comfortable because Bermuda is very hot. Um, yeah, it's very comfortable. Yeah. When you travel around the world, do you do you wear flip flops or do you wear shoes? I wear, and there's a reason I'm asking this. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, <flip-flops, laughs> I mean flip flops right now. And uh, when I travel, okay. I'm always in flip flops. That's very so. Yeah. You and I are the same in that we both wear flip flops religiously. In fact, I'm trying to actually launch my own flip flop line called Fancy Flops. If you want to launch it with me, we could talk about it later because I feel like I'll tell you a funny story too. I I was in Dubai and I was trying to get into like a really fancy restaurant in flip flops. And you think out of all places in the world in Dubai, you can get in and because everyone's wearing sandals, right? And and I'm standing at the door with my wife. And the guy won't let me into the restaurant wearing flip flops. And all of a sudden, another guy walks by me in sandals. And I said, well, how come he can go in? And he said, you're not Emirati. I was like, oh, I couldn't get in because but I wear flip flops everywhere. Um, I'm going to a wedding next week. I'm going to be in a tuxedo and flip flops. And, you know, I met with Anderson Cooper and I'm wearing flip flops. The reason I do it and tell me if you agree, the reason I do it is well one it's very comfortable and 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 i like when my feet can breathe but i think really realistically i do it and tell me if if you agree we do it because we can and it's like a constant reminder that we have to work really hard because if we don't work really hard and i'm speaking for myself if i don't work really hard every single day then i'll have to go back and work for a real company where i'm gonna have to wear shoes (laughs) shoes <laughs> right <laughs> so i think i definitely agree with both of those things um yeah and uh, and also i have very i have so many i couldn't tell you how many experiences i've had uh, where i show up in flip-flops to a restaurant they said no you can't go in and i just turn around and walk away uh, i've had so many of those uh, experiences yeah but um yeah and uh, i think yeah i totally agree for me the the direct feel is comfort right so yeah your feet can breathe but then there's an underlying thing where we have that freedom we do use that freedom but also we do remind ourselves that we're still down to earth do you wear good good quality ones because if you're walking on these shoes all day um you have to make sure that they're the quality is good like uh, i wear olakai's because they have the arch for the middle part of the foot okay it's they're really good and i also wear this other brand called hari mari and I'm giving them like free shit. They're not my sponsors. I just love their their flip flops, and they're not cheap. They're like two hundred dollars, but it's worth it because I wear them every single day. Right. Um, I think I'm. Uh, I actually. I think the pair I'm wearing is Skechers. Uh, it's very uh, soft. Skechers. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit cheaper than the ones that I think you mentioned. I don't. Yeah, but I'm usually not that picky. But they're pretty comfortable. All right. Good. As long as the as long as they they take care of your feet because your feet are the most important thing. Someone wise once told me. Make sure you take care of your feet because without your feet, you can't really do anything. Yep. Um, okay. Not talking about flip flops anymore. Um, I want to talk about BNB. When you, when, when, when BNB originally launched, um, there was a utility for it, right? And there was a, there was a reason and you had to launch and grow the company. A lot of projects launch a token and you know, I think better than 99% of the world know that they just 
forget about it. They don't care about the token holders. They don't care. One would argue that Binance Chain, Binance Coin, um, the whole Binance ecosystem is probably one of the pro- only projects of the top 10 that really is giving utility and giving value back to token holders. Why? Um, I think it's very it's fairly simple, right? So uh, <clears throat> you issue a token, people invest, people buy it uh, as an inv- uh, m- mostly because they believe in you. So you do want to return the value. <clears throat> And the best way, so historically, I think even today, not historically, uh, we still have the saying that max, uh, the number one priority for any organization is to ma- maximize shareholder value. I don't believe that. So um, I believe in maximizing the community value, the people who use you. Well, shareholder value is okay, but we got to view token holders as shareholders, not just pure equity shareholders or, or, as shareholders. So uh, that's a very that's a big change in in the thinking. That, that, that's a that's a huge change. But given that we are able to raise money on using tokens now, using crypto tokens, um, the your users are your investors. Uh, that, so n- before we have VCs as your investors, and, and they're not your users. And your users are paying for your service in one way or another, um, either directly or through or by selling the data uh, to advertisers, and and then you monetize for the VCs. Uh, I think that model is kind of old and uh, should be should be should be going away. The new model is your users are your investors, and also they are paying you directly in crypto for whatever service they 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 rent uh, uh, you render to them. And it's a very di- it's a very simple direct uh, micro payment type of model. So every transaction is uh, is should be low cost, uh, but then you as, as long as you have a large number of transactions going on, then you uh, uh, the whole the whole ecosystem works. So if you have that kind of mindset, um, so there's a there's a very big difference in the two different type of mindsets. The traditional way is okay. So um, uh, we want to maximize shareholder value. So we want to we issue a token. We want to sell all the tokens to the other people, the the, the retail guys or the users, and then um, we sell all of them. We take BNB or so not BNB. We take BTC back and we sell them into US dollars, and then we give that to our investors, the VC investors. That's called the maximizing shareholder value. Uh, that model, I think, will be out very soon. Uh, the new model is, okay, so we don't really have a lot of VC investors, and um, uh, we, max, we, we, increase, we focus on increasing the value uh, of the coin. And the best way to do that is increasing utility, utility, so more ways to use it. So Bitcoin does, Demand. Bitcoin does this really well in a decentralized way. And we try to copy that, right? So from airline tickets to coffee, paying for trading fees, uh, working apartments, um, uh, loans. Uh, so we, we're now building an ecosystem around BNB. So it is my belief that in the historic way, you can build a company IPO and monetize on the equity part of it. Uh, but in the new way, uh, the company equity, uh, even though early, in the early days, the company equity may be the higher value of uh, because you, it's very hard to build an ecosystem. But if you do build the ecosystem, let's say like you have hotels accepting your coin, you have travel agencies accepting your coin, uh, you have a uh, new project coming up that's raising BNB. If we have like it, it, that ecosystem can be a hundred times or a thousand times bigger than Binance.com. And then the BNB value will be high uh, if that ecosystem is large and that's bigger than the equity of the company. So it's not just about one company. So I think there's a new... Uh, very different type of thinking that goes on um, for this new type of uh, blockchain enabled businesses. I think a lot of people doesn't quite understand that fully yet. Uh, luckily, we are one. Of the, we see this a lot. Number one, we did the Binance thing ourselves. Number two, we see a lot of different projects going on around us through Launchpad or other things. So we have a different mentality. Every question that I've asked you, you've had you've had an, a really good answer where you've you've basically said like you just did. Um, People don't really understand it. We were the first and we did it. And, and now um, a lot of people are doing it and it's grown like you're trailblazing. You're trailblazing. You're literally it's like you're walking through a forest and there's no path and you're walking through a jungle and you have a knife or a, a seath or whatever. And you're chopping down the trees and you're creating a path. That's that's literally the best the best analogy I could think of. But. If you if you imagine if you imagine like now someone's gonna make a meme by the way of you like in a jungle with with a big knife going through, but but you know um, for a second you're walking through this jungle from an outside perspective it looks like you already know the path 
it looks like you already know what direction to go and which trees to chop down and which plants to chop down and which to grow. Like you, it looks like, and from your answers, it looks like you're already, it's like, oh, like this is so simple that how could we not do this? Like a paradigm shift in going from, from equity value to token value. Like, yeah, it sounds great now because you proved the theory, dude. Like you proved it. But before you did, no one, and people would call you crazy. How do you know these things? Are you just, are you just really good at winging it and saying like, oh, if I fail, then who cares? Do you, do you not care about failure that much that you can just say, I'm going to try. And if it doesn't work out, who cares? Have you, have you made any mistakes in that, in that? Oh yeah. yeah. So number one, uh, I think the uh, uh, chopping through a forest is a kind of a good analogy. And don't steal my analogy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> and um, uh, also, we never, we don't have the answer. So it's never like we knew the path before. It was, it was really going through a jungle. We don't know where the path is. Uh, we kind of know the general direction. We want to get to the top of the hill uh, somehow. So we're kind of walking upwards. Uh, but sometimes we will uh, get lost. You know. So uh, we also make a lot of mistakes. Um, so uh, I think for me personally, it's very much uh, trial and error. Um, so I tell my team that we want to spend 2% of the time on decisions and 98% of the time on, in execution. And I also tell them, uh, as long as we don't make completely stupid decisions, if we, if we make a dis for example, if we have a path that's going forward, that's the direction we want to go. But then we make a decision kind of in the wrong direction. We go sideways for a little bit, but as soon as we, as, as long as we can recognize it very quickly and then make another decision to kind of curve back, that's okay. So we do a lot of those kind of things uh, where uh, to the outside they may they may or may not know a lot of the mistakes we made. We made so many mistakes. Um, it's like I, I can go on for I can go on for days talking about the different mistakes we made. But the key is not to make a big mistake. So you can make many small mistakes. And if you if, so, you basically, if you chop down a tree and see there's no path afterwards, um, then you got you got you got to try a different way. So you got to turn around and go back. Yeah. So it's it like a, a lot of stuff that even I'm talking about now. Uh, maybe I didn't fully understand them a year ago. Even uh, not not to mention that when we started, when we started, we wanted we wanted to go the VC route uh, first, and then some guy convinced me to do the ICO thing. So yeah, it's, it's all learning in the process. Who convinced you? Well, you don't have to name him specifically, but was he someone close to you? That's a big decision. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I, I went to a hot pot, hot pot dinner in Chengdu in China, um, and uh, it was organized by Chen Duo Guo. Uh, he's now in the States. Oh, he's, he's, been, oh, he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. I know him very yeah. well. So he's, 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 very, he's fairly famous in China, uh, um, and uh, he, was, he was into ICOs much earlier than I am. And he's a good friend. And then he organized a pot, pot, the hot pot dinner with 500, 500 people attending. Roger Ver was there. Uh, Zen was there. A bunch of like um, uh, Bobby from uh, Crypto.com was there. So about uh, uh, 500 people in a big hot pot restaurant. Uh, he paid two BTC for it that night. And then everybody's talking about a um, um, uh, ICOs, ICOs. And I told him, well, I'm thinking about doing a crypto to crypto exchange. And um, that's like, no, you got to do an ICO. You got to do an ICO. So it was like that, that it was that night. Wow. Does he know this story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he knows this story. And I asked him to be my, um, what we call the, uh, the advisor uh, for the ICO. And uh, yeah, and he also, uh, he's supposed to get a portion of BNB for his, uh, uh, for him being an advisor. And he now donates all of that to Binance Charity. Wow. Uh, which is a huge sum actually uh, today. Yeah. What's, what's the plan with Binance Charity? Um, so when so back in 2014, um, I wrote even when I was in uh, blockchain.info, I wrote a little article uh, posted on GitHub. You can still find it on GitHub, dated 2014. Um, I think blockchain is a very uh, good tool for charity because it allows the transactions to be tracked uh, transparently. Um, and I back in 2014, I kind of had this idea that if you marry uh, the blockchain technology with charity, now you can do 100% transparent charities all the way down to the end beneficiary. The end, um, the, uh, the requirement is the, everybody in that process need to, uh, needs to use crypto, which is also very good for crypto because that's now, now that's education and adoption, right? So, and now you're giving money, well, you're helping people, you're giving money away. And th those guys should be incentivized uh, to learn about crypto. And it will be a very positive experience for them. Uh, their first experience with crypto will be 
a very positive one. So instead of like, I don't know, back a few years, people say the drug laws and all, all this stuff. So, but at the time I didn't have, I didn't have the means to push it. Uh, I didn't have the resources and I also didn't have the influence. And um, so when Binance took off and became the largest exchange, I suddenly realized that now we have the, we have, we, we have ways to push it. Uh, and I'm meeting with like presidents, prime ministers, head of states. Um, I said, well, now we can, we, we, we can push this. So uh, the goal is really uh, do increase the uh, charity uh, so we can make a 100% transparent charity. Uh, the transparency solves two problems for charity. Um, number one is the uh, corruption. But I think more important, so you li- eliminate any possibility of corruption potentially. Number two, more importantly, it encourages people to donate because people uh, there's more tangible results. You can see which school that your funds went to, which kid in Africa you you help directly. You can see the guys, you can see, see the kid's face. So um, that's that tangibility makes people more want to do charity more. And uh, for 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 uh, uh, for the blockchain for for our, for ourselves, for our industry, and for myself. Um, this is a very good way to increase adoption. So I think in Africa so far uh, this year, we have helped 20, more than 20,000 kids. And in a few year time, when these kids grow up, they will all know blockchain. They will own, and they will have a very positive connotation to it. So um, this education and adoption, and when the industry gets bigger, uh, hopefully Binance will, will also, uh, and everybody else in the industry will also benefit. So for me, it's a no brainer. Uh, it's just that luckily now we have the resources to do it. And very luckily, I ran, in, I ran into one of my old friends, uh, Helen High, who is really, really good at this. And she completely took this and ran, and, 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 and made, made it really good. So, um, yeah, um, it's just one of those things we tried and worked. What's the future for it? I mean, what do you, what, where do you, do you, do you see like a decentralized, decentralized charities becoming the next um, way all charities operate? I definitely think so. I'm not sure if all charities have to go on the blockchain. Uh, there are some very well-run charities without the blockchain, but I think with the blockchain, so much easier. Um, so I do think it will get pretty pretty big. So uh, we are now uh, we are now helping uh, about a hundred uh, schools in Africa, and we're launching the second program to help with uh, uh, female hygiene, like basically we call a um, uh, period of poverty. So we uh, we donate tampons for girls in Africa to improve their, their their hygiene and health. So that's it's expanding very quickly now. My um, email and chat inbox is like maybe two percent of what yours is like on a daily basis. How do you manage it? Um, actually, honestly, I don't I don't I don't look at emails that much now. Um, everything is more chat based. So I do have almost every chat program uh, uh, available on the planet installed on my phone. Um, but there's uh, there's a couple I use with internal teams, which I check at a very high priority, and then the external ones. Don't tell people because then they're gonna like find you on there. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm getting pretty good at like ignoring the 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 the, uh, the number badge, um, and then the others I just try um, I just try to respond once in a while. And but the place where I'm most active is around Twitter publicly. So uh, I find Twitter works works the best for uh, mass communication uh, with uh, in- engagement with their users. Your funds are Safu. Yeah, funds are Safu, yes. <laughs> it's great how you took something like that and you rolled with it. It seems like that's your personality. If something happens like a mistake or a you know, basic thing like just how you pronounce a word or spell a word, you run with it. So, I mean, do you have other mistakes that you've made that you say, you know what, I'm just going to gonna run with it i'm not gonna try to correct it uh yeah well that's kind of my personality so i'm, I'm <laughs> i have a pretty laid-back personality uh, so uh, i'm not i think i'm not super arrogant so uh, I, uh one one guy described it as, uh, as, as rolling with the punches so i think that kind of describes my personality uh quite well uh and the saifu thing actually it was not my pronunciation it was um uh, a guy made a YouTube video uh, about funds are safe, and then uh, but he used the Japanese pronunciation. I, th- I guess the guy thought I was Japanese because I go to Japan. I, li- I did live in Japan for quite a while, um, and the Japanese pronunciation is funds are safe. And then he was repeating and repeating and repeating. And then um, uh, on the next, uh, so I, I really liked that video. And on the next upgrade, we said uh, the uh, scheduled upgrade, big upgrade, funds are safe uh, with a uh, fu. And then the community really liked it, so I think it's fine. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty, I have a pretty good uh, appreciation and tolerance for uh, for jokes. I uh, I love them. 
Well, did, so that was that a was it a mistake or was it on purpose? Uh, so my my one was not was not a mistake. I was on purpose and I was promoting his video and the guy. And the, oh. So it was it was like an inside joke for the, the core community who seen that that video was quite viral, but not everybody saw it. But the guys who saw it liked it right away, and we promoted that video a number of times. And the video still still up there. What's your main What's your main um, focus on 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 what your daily what you do every day? I mean, what are you are you acting as more of a chairman? Are you working on vision business development? Are you managing the team? I assume you have good managers that manage day to day options. What motivates you today? What are you working on today, tomorrow, next week? Sure, um, I'm still more involved on the technical product side, uh, on the stra- uh, the strategy for uh, or the vision for the t- uh, technical product side. So. I think basically uh, on the day-to-day operations, I don't get involved at all now. Um, and even, like today, if there's a system problem, if the system's lagging or uh, stuff like that, that, they don't even wake me up. They just handle it. Um, and they will they will wake me up if they if they want me to tweak something. That's all. <laughs> and uh, um, on the marketing side, <laughs> on the investment side, on the listing side, the, the so all. Uh, uh, all of in the, all of those groups, we have uh, very strong teams, uh, even on the technical side. So um, I I kind of spend more time just sort of visualizing uh, what what are we gonna do, what kind of big bigger products we want to do or or not do. Um, so like Binance Dex, um, I spend a little bit of time on that, uh, just sort of at the high level direction level, not coding. Um, for example, they were com- they were debating: Do we do multi signature uh, feature first, or do we do privacy co- feature first? Uh, so it's those kind of very high level uh, discussions. Um, and then the rest of the time, I uh, uh, spend just just sort of cheering the team up. Basically, um, I actually don't do very much now. Um, the team is pretty strong. The team is pretty self uh, sustained. One last question I wanted to to ask you before before we end. I um. What happened to your original Twitter account? Because you talk about Twitter, but in that old email signature, you had a different Twitter account. And when I checked it, it said that it was suspended. Yes. So uh, um, I I believe it's because I took off. So I had my old Twitter account, which I kind of was trying to grow. And I thought I had a very large following, which was about like 16K people. Um, and then, um, but one day when I was trying to change phone numbers, I took the original phone number off and the, so the account got suspended. I couldn't get it back. Um, so I tried to email support. Um, I just did, couldn't get it back. And then in August um, uh, 2017, after Binance launched, I was like, Ma, I'm just going to have to start a new Twitter account. So I started a new Twitter account. Um, so it was unfortunate. Yeah. I wonder if we can call up Twitter and get that old account back unsuspended. I probably can, but I don't know how to migrate the current uh, uh, followers to there because now, now I now have a much bigger following. No, you can't, but I, I think I'd love to see the tweets. I'd love to see what you said. I'm probably going to go and, and figure out a way to read them. I'm sure people would want to know what you said before Binance. Like, um, it's probably very interesting to, to read. It's like... Um, reading things that people said before they became famous. Right, right. Um, I actually didn't tweet that much. I was tweeting a bit for blockchain.info. I was tweeting a little bit for OKCoin. Um, but I wasn't a very heavy Twitter user. Um, and I've only became a heavy Twitter user recently. Uh, uh, even You taught Donald Trump how to tweet, right? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I taught him, he wouldn't tweet that. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I hope to meet you soon. Um, I don't need to tell my users where to find you because they already probably do. You're at Twitter at CZ Binance, Binance.com, um, BNB, Binance Charity, uh, so many projects that you're involved in. Thank you so much for being a part of this ecosystem and coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Charlie, for having me. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord the creator of crypto mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at cryptomining.tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.